Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World. Later in the programme, much more. Finland turns against the Euro, for example. We'll be talking to their foreign minister about that surprise this weekend. And to the exiled Crown Prince of Libya. What does his future hold, as well as what does Libya's future hold? But we begin with Italy, a country which previously had very close ties to Colonel Gaddafi's government, but now is a key player in NATO's response in Libya. Airstrikes are being launched from its air bases, and next month, Rome is hosting an international meeting on Libya. Earlier, I spoke to Italy's foreign minister, Franco Frattini, just before Italy formally announced that it would, alongside Britain and France, be sending military advisers to the rebels in Benghazi. I started by asking him whether he was worried that the NATO-led operation in Libya was heading towards a stalemate. Well, uh, I think, first of all, NATO has been doing a lot in order to stop violence, to block all the horrible crimes uh, that uh, Gaddafi was committing in many cities in Libya. So I have to first commend the commitment of NATO. But now I have, I have to admit, in many cases, Gaddafi has been changing his tactics. For example, by putting tanks in the streets, in a very populated areas, and that makes a bit more difficult uh, airstrikes, air-to-ground attacks, exactly because he is hiding tanks in the populated areas. This is not a stalemate, but it's something we have to face in the very near future. I see, right. Because, of course, you are only one of three countries that recognize the opposition in Libya. And you met the Libyan opposition leader on Tuesday of this week, in fact. Yes. Mr. Mustafa Abdel Jalil. Yes. Um, how did the conversation go? Well, it, it did. It did. It was a very good conversation. He presented a thorough picture of the situation in Libya. He described the uh, massive crimes committed by the regime, particularly around the city of Misurata, which is uh, really a martyr city under the uh, horrible siege. And then he described the developments that are quite good because uh, uh, an increasing number of people uh, understood that Gaddafi not only is not uh, longer a possible interlocutor, but is committing horrible crime against his own people. He did ask, uh, he asked uh, something more. He said, well, uh, we need training, first of all. We need uh, self-defense instruments and tools because uh, it is very difficult to fight against Gaddafi uh, troops that are mainly mercenaries in the streets against snipers that are uh, on the roofs of the cities. And so he asked for w helping them in terms of self-defense arms and weapons. This is something we will be discussing during the next contact group, international contact group of Libya that will take place in Rome on May the 5th. May the 5th, right. He was also quoted, the uh, Libyan opposition leader, as saying that he thought 10,000 had now been killed during this crisis. Yes. 10,000 Libyans. Did that uh, sound accurate to you? Yes, I think uh, uh, these estimates are uh, credible because, uh, frankly speaking, uh, we have, as Italians, uh, doctors that are working now, today, in Misurata, and paramedics as well, and they are reporting to us about the horrible situation in the hospitals. We have been evacuating a number of seriously wounded persons. We promised to Mr. Jalil to evacuate, to bring to Italy an additional number of 100 wounded persons from the hospitals in the region. And uh, we heard 
stories that tell us how difficult is the situation under the attack of Gaddafi. And what about the actual active next step? Uh, could that step be, if not ground troops, but could the Allies actually arm and equip the rebels? Well, uh, we believe uh, at the current moment we can help by uh, providing the uh, opposition and the council in Benghazi with uh, self-defense uh, instruments like uh, radio telecommunication apparatus or some, I would say, protection uniforms and so on and so on, we will be discussing about weapons because there is not yet an international consensus. You know, America is doubtful, uh, France as well. UK said uh, it's premature to take a decision. We need a, a, a legal international framework on the conformity of eventual decision with the resolution 1973. But that said, the counter group in Rome will be a good occasion to broaden and to deepen the discussion about that. And do you think if Colonel Gaddafi is captured and captured alive, should he face a war crimes trial, do you think? Well, I think uh, the uh, prosecutor Ocampo and his collaborators are collecting a number of important elements for the indictment that uh, likely will be decided about mid-May. But before that, I think uh, what happened recently, for example, with a large number of refugees uh, pushed from Libya towards the Italian shores is another element to be taken into consideration because uh, many of these people unfortunately died and they were pushed from the forces of Gaddafi to leave the country in a very poor conditions and many of them died on their way towards Italy. I think uh, this is another element then the prosecutor Ocampo could take into consideration because uh, when it comes to massively uh, 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 pushing people towards dying in Mediterranean, this is a crime. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Frattini, for joining us today. We appreciate it, your clear report uh, and your terrific English as well. We appreciate it and look forward to talking again. Thank you very much. It will be a pleasure. Our thanks to Franco Frattini there. Uh, but while many eyes are on Italy, this week the big European surprise came from the northern periphery, Finland. Finnish voters went to the polls for a general election and gave a fifth of the votes to the anti-Euro nationalist party True Finns, which rejects funds for EU squanderers, as they call them, and opposes immigration. The shape of Finland's new coalition uh, is still uncertain, but observers fear that this result has the potential to sink Portugal's bailout and even the euro itself. Well, to tell us how and what and why and when, uh, I'm joined here from Helsinki by the Finnish Foreign Minister Alexander Stubb. How will the coalition finally form up in the, in the new setup? Well, we'll just have to see. I mean, Finns are really two things. One, we are very pragmatic, and two, we are very realistic. And usually we're, we deliver. We're used to coalitions. Uh, you know, my party is very pro-European, very international. The true Finns are a little bit on the other side of the spectrum, but I'm quite confident that within about four weeks we'll be able to form a government and we'll take our responsibilities uh, with the euro as well. The leading members of that will be the National Coalition Party, the True Finns, and who else will be the key part of the uh, government? Yeah, it's probably going to be, most probably, centre-right, that's us, the National Coalition Party. Then number two came the Social Democrats, they are very pro-European. And then number three, the True Finns, and then we're also talking about a couple or, or at least one smaller party. So anything can materialise, but I'm sure that we will be able to deliver within a few weeks. And how will the attitude change towards 
uh, the Eurozone towards Europe and so on with this new with this new mixture, this new coalition. Will the policy towards the Eurozone change in any way? Well, I hope it doesn't change that much because you must remember that Finland comes from the geographic periphery of Europe, but we have always been in the institutional core, and we intend to do so. We feel very strongly that the core of Europe is now the six euro countries that have a triple A rating in the credit markets. We've been very, very tough in sticking to our obligations within the euro framework. There are only two euro countries that fulfill the Maastricht criteria right now inside the euro. They're Luxembourg and Finland. So I don't foresee a major change uh, in this line of thinking. How, how are you going to reach a meeting of the minds on how you're going to deal with the EU with the true Finns? Well, you know, Finns are very pragmatic. The Finns have voted, they have given us a mixed message, and we have to live with it. And what usually happens is that we set up a government program and that becomes our Bible. That's what we're going to be negotiating within the next few d days. It's a little bit like the coalition in the UK right now. Perhaps someone in the beginning said that the Conservatives would be perhaps anti-European or the Lib Dems pro-European, but they have actually found a quite a good of a middle ground, and I'm sure we'll find the same uh, here in Finland as well. It is in our vested interest to be pro-European. 50% of our GDP comes from exports, and a big chunk of that goes to Europe, so there's no point for us to marginalize, oursel uh, marginalize ourselves voluntarily. And how, how do you think the bailout mechanism dotted around Europe as it now is, how do you think it's working? Expensive for Finland, but is it working in its own terms? I think it's working in its own terms. And the example that I give is that we had a huge banking crisis here in Finland in the early 1990s. At that stage, we had interest rates hitting 20% and unemployment rates over 15%. Now, we've been in the post Lehman Brothers world for two and a half years. The consequences in Finland, interest rates around 2% and unemployment between 7 and 8. And we had economic growth uh, in January by 6% and this year predictions at 3%. So I think we've been able to salvage the biggest problems. We've stopped the leak with Greece, Ireland, and now Portugal. And I think this is pretty much it. That's at least uh, what I'm hoping for. Uh, so in that sense, I would argue that the interim mechanisms are working well. And then, of course, the new permanent mechanisms are coming in in 2013. And you think, therefore, that there will be, you'll be able to avoid anyone falling at this current fence at the moment? That that you see the same membership of the EU in a year's time, Alex? Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, there could be some ripples here and there, but I think we've been able to stop the bleeding so far in Portugal as well. I mean, we will deliver in one way or another. I know there is a lot of sensationalist, almost demagogic journalism floating around Europe right now. That's what always happens when you get a nationalist, uh, anti-European, a party uh, getting into power in a particular country. We've seen this general trend, but I would argue so far so good. And we shouldn't also forget that this is not a crisis of the euro. This was a crisis that started with the financial markets in the US. From there it went to Iceland, from there to Latvia, from there to Romania, from there to Hungary, and then it hit the eurozone. And if we did not have the euro, you'd basically be looking at World War III amongst currencies right now with devaluations left and right. So, as I said, touch wood, so far, so good. And do and you think the true Finns will agree to participate in the Portuguese bailout? Well, uh, with power comes responsibility. And I've known Timo Soini, the leader of the true Finns party, for the better part of seven years. He's a good, trustworthy guy. You can work with him. And I know that, you know, if we're looking at Finnish jobs, if we're looking at the Finnish economy, which are completely interlinked, of course, to the Portuguese package, we will find a way out. I mean, there will be wording. We can do perhaps a couple little jigs left and right. But at the end of the day, I think uh, if and when we get a new government, uh, we will uh, deliver. And I hope that uh, Timo Soini the chairman of the True Finns party will deliver uh, as well. Well, thank you very much. I like that phrase. A few jigs left and right. Well, well, we'll look forward to watching the jigs to the right melody at the time. And thank you very much for joining us, Alex. And uh, we look forward to coming back to you again to get an update on how you're feeling. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, David. Anytime. Always a pleasure to be on with you. One person watching events unfolding in Libya 
from a unique viewpoint is Crown Prince Mohammed El Sanusi. Colonel Gaddafi came to power in 1969 by overthrowing King Idris and the Libyan royal family to boot. Crown Prince Sanusi, who's next in line for the throne, if there is a throne, now lives in exile in Europe. And he's perhaps understandably desperate for the revolution to succeed and for Colonel Gaddafi himself to be overthrown. And he joins us now from Brussels. Your Royal Highness, um, the latest news we heard from London was that Mr. Haig there, William Haig, has said that the UK is to send in military advisers to Benghazi to help and to instruct. Um, do, you do, do you welcome that? Thank you, Sir David. Um, I support any uh, things which is make my people uh, safe, uh, people inside. Uh, they are dying every day. And uh, Gaddafi and his troops killing people every day, and they're in danger. So uh, what I support, I support any action which is make my people safe. And tell me, if there was what they sometimes call in America mission creep, if the next step was for countries like Britain and France to send in troops to Libya, would you say that was a good idea or could that lead to more violence? Right now, Libyan people, they don't need any troops inside, but if the Libyan people in the future, they're asking for that, I will support. And what more support can Colonel Gaddafi's enemies around the world give to the Libyan people? The support which is the Libyan people, they ask, it's to make Gaddafi and his troops stop uh, sending their bombs. Because right now, there is a lot of situation uh, which is becoming uh, terrible, and uh, there is a lot of rapes, for example, going on now uh, with Gaddafi troops against their own people. So what I'm asking, actually, to make sure my people there are safe and they put more pressure for Gaddafi to leave. That there can be no solution where Gaddafi stays ruling in Tripoli, for instance, and part of the West, that in fact, for this crisis to be over, Gaddafi has to leave. Gaddafi, he declared a war against six million people, and he's the main issue, he's the main problems. And I think there is no way to stay in the power because he's shooting his own people, and this is the time, is the time for him now to leave. Otherwise, they're going to catch him. And Libyan people, they, they're ready for, uh, for any action to uh, do anything to make Gaddafi um, uh, weaker and also to make sure he's not in the country. He have to leave the country. He's the main problem. And who will manage to actually force him out? Uh, um, will it be the Libyan rebels or will it be foreign troops? I think, as I say before, uh, the coalition uh, force, they make sure they everybody's safe. And uh, as I say today in my speech in the European Parliament, uh, the coalition force and international community, they should put, put more pressure on Gaddafi to make sure he stop killing his own people. And the freedom fighter, actually, in Libya, they have the similar situation before, in 1911, when Italian invaded Libya. And Italy, they stayed there, stood there for 40 years. And in the end, the Libyan people win, and they have their own country, and they have freedom. They win the freedom. Libyan people, they, they will win this battle against one man who want to kill six million people because of his ego. And what role would you like to play in the future here? I mean, do you see yourself returning to Libya as a soldier against Gaddafi or returning as the future king? Do you in fact think that the royal family could return to rule with parliamentary rule and constitutional rule in Libya or not? First of all, I want to make sure Gaddafi is not in Libya anymore. Second, we want to make sure everybody, every single Libyan, they have security and they can live in peace in his own home. Second, Libyan people, they have to decide what kind of system and what kind of democracy they want. For me, I see myself as a servant to the Libyan people and my family serve the Libyan people for uh, 18 years under uh, monarchy, and I'm going to do the same. I will be servant to the Libyan people, and I will respect the wish of Libyan people. If they choose monarchy, we are ready to serve. 
if they choose Republican, I will respect that, and still I'm going to serve my country in my way. What has particularly shocked you most in terms of what Colonel Gaddafi and his soldiers have done? Are there some incidents that have particularly made you angry? I think uh, what makes me angry and shock me to see uh, a person who's bombing his own people and frightening ch children and uh, innocent people in their own home. And um, I think is the time for, for, uh, for international community to put more pressure. You cannot, you know, I don't think so. I saw anybody before as a president who called himself president, killing his own people. As I say before, Gaddafi, he declared a war against six million people, and this is ridiculous. And do you feel that if at the end of this crisis it is the case that Colonel Gaddafi is captured alive, um, do you think he should be tried for war crimes, for the killing of civilians? I've been talking to uh, my people inside uh, Libya, in Benghazi, and also in Tripoli, and uh, most of them, they want to see justice. We need justice uh, for, for, uh, for this trial. If there is a trial for Gaddafi, we need justice. And because Gaddafi, he has to answer for all the crimes he commits through justice. And so, as you speak to us now from Brussels, are you feeling optimistic that Colonel Gaddafi's regime will fall? Or are you afraid that Gaddafi's troops are getting stronger? What do you think will happen next, now? Gaddafi is, is becoming weaker and weaker every day. And if they continue bombing his troop, he will fall. And if indeed Colonel Gaddafi does fall, um, and there's a new Libya without Gaddafi, would you like to return to live in your homeland? First of all, I want to make sure each Libyan who live in exile, they can go back through the airport safely. And of course, we want to make sure Gaddafi is not there, either his family or his regime. Second, the Libyan people, they have to uh, decide what sort of system they want. For me, as I say before, Libya is in my heart and I will do any things to make sure everybody lives safe and they have their own uh, democracy and system, which is choose. Well, sir, thank you. We thank you so much for joining us and putting your point of view across so, so clearly. We, we thank you very much, Your Royal Highness. Thank, thank you. you. In a minute, two dramatic stories. We'll be looking at the terrifying drugs war in Mexico and a discussion about whether Eurozone countries in trouble will or should default. All of that after this short break.